Okay, well, it's a pleasure to welcome uh, Shane Dooley to give today's uh, seminar. He is going to tell us about quantum sensing via many body scars. Thanks, uh, Shane. Hey, thanks, Dan Joe. Yep. Yeah. Um, so this talk is, uh, it's kind of at the intersection between two different topics that have got a bit of interest in the last few years. Uh, one is many body scars and the other one is quantum sensing. So um, many, many body scars are a feature that uh, have been recently shown to appear in, uh, in isolated quantum systems and in particular in non-integrable isolated quantum systems. And these are systems that would usually be expected to thermalize uh, or observables in, the, in this system would usually be expected to thermalize as the system evolves. Um, but because of these many body scars, uh, it was shown that actually some systems don't thermalize and they can actually kind of have these revivals where the initial state kind of um, revives. And so this, um, this animation I found, uh, I hope you can see it actually, but uh, this was on, uh, it was from this quantum magazine. It's an online science magazine. They wrote a popular science article about many body scars and this was their kind of dramatic uh, illustration just to show this effect of, instead of thermalizing, reviving. Uh, and the quantum sensing part comes into it because uh, many quantum sensing schemes kind of uh, involve uh, extracting some information from the oscillation of a quantum system. So there's some, uh, maybe the frequency of the, os the oscillation might have some uh, information about some parameter you're trying to estimate. So that, that's kind of the connection between this, uh, this revival and the quantum sensing. But I'll explain a bit more about that uh, as I go along. So uh, the outline of the talk, I'm gonna start with just some background and just motivation. So I'll kind of flesh out a little bit what I said there in the opening slide. Um, and I'll talk about some of the, a couple of the papers that's, that kind of kicked off this in, uh, interest in many body scars. And then I'll make the connection with quantum sensing a bit more concrete than I have done there in the, in the intro slide. And then I'll show you two examples where this is, uh, is pretty clear, I think, that, that you can actually uh, get some advantage in quantum sensing because of these many body scars. So um, first, uh, first, I'm just going to say a bit about uh, equilibration and thermalization of isolated quantum systems. So suppose that you have an isolated quantum system with a, a Hamiltonian with these eigenvalues and eigenstates here, just given by just just one yeah. second. Uh, Luke is asking if, he, if he's the only one that can't see the slides. Is there some problem? I can see them fine. I only see ice cream. Oh, okay. So how oh, yeah, that, long? That's all we that, I thought that was what you meant to say. Oh, okay. okay. All right. uh, something's gone wrong there. So let me stop sharing and then reshare with a more advanced slide. <laughs> So it seems like the, the animation kind of broke us somehow. Yeah, we, we saw no animation. Oh, you saw no animation. OK. Ah, OK, that's a shame. So I can explain the animation to you. The animation was supposed to be that ice cream melting and then kind of refreezing uh, and just going on a loop with the melting refreezing. And that was supposed to be this uh, dramatization of this many body scarring effect. And um, so just to repeat then uh, quickly what I said there, this, this, the outline is just going to do a bit of background and motivation, kind of uh, explaining um, what I uh, briefly outlined there in the opening slide. And then uh, a couple of examples to show concretely how many body scars can be exploited for quantum sensing. I, I assume everybody can see the slides now and it's moving along okay? Yeah, no, that's fine now. Yeah. So uh, first, uh, I'll just say a bit about equilibration and thermalization of isolated quantum systems. And I guess this is something that needs to be introduced a little bit, because if you have an isolated quantum system, uh, it's just evolving by the usual Schrodinger equation, unitary evolution. So it's always in a pure state if you start in a pure state. So it's not really clear what, what's meant there by thermalization, for example, where you might associate a thermal state with some kind of uh, uh, mixing, uh, the state becoming mixed. So here, what I mean by, well, first, the, the if, I, if you think of an observable uh, O, 
uh, then the time evolved observable is just given by uh, by this expression, just by the usual unitary dynamics. And here the Cs are the, um, the initial energy amplitudes. And these O, alpha, alpha prime, these are the, um, the matrix elements of the, uh, of the observable in the energy eigenbasis. And actually these matrix elements are going to play an important role later. So just to, just to mention that. So we say that the system has reached equilibrium if it gets close to its time, its infinite time averaged value. So that's what the, this red uh, thing is with the overbar. And um, it's the infinite time average of the uh, time evolving observable. And if you, if you assume that there's no degeneracies in the spectrum of this Hamiltonian, then you can actually just do the integral and find that the, uh, the off diagonal parts uh, uh, vanish in this infinite limit. And you just get that the, the equilibrium value is um, this weighted mixture of the um, of the diagonal uh, eigenstate matrix elements, or observable matrix elements. So, you know, not, obviously not every, not every isolated quantum system is going to reach an equilibrium, but if it does, this, will, this is the state that you expect it to, to go to. This will be the equilibrium state. And there's a step, a step further than this as well. So even if it does reach some kind of equilibrium value, there's nothing, it doesn't necessarily have to be what you'd expect thermal equilibrium. So for, for this talk, I'm going to say that the thermal, the, the value you expect if it reaches thermal equilibrium is this micro, micro canonical average. So this is, these are these, uh, these uh, eigenstate expectation values for the observable O. And the average of those in some energy shell. And this energy shell is centered around the, the initial state energy here. So um, you can see that these two things, like on the face of it, are, are kind of different. You know, the equilibrium value has, um, it depends on this full distribution of, uh, of the, uh, in the initial energy distribution, C alpha. And then this thermal average, the microcanonical average, really only depends on the, um, on the average initial energy. So there's kind of a, a discrepancy there that's kind of on the face of it not so easy to understand. So an important question then might be when does when does this uh, observable O actually thermalize to the microcanonical average? And one thing is that we can say is that you wouldn't expect it really if H if the Hamiltonian has many local conserved quantities. These local conserved quantities you can think of as kind of uh, constraints on the dynamics that kind of prevent the state from really exploring the full range of Hilbert space and kind of um, reaching some kind of thermal average. For example, integrable systems uh, will have many local conserved quantities. Uh, for example, the, you know, the most trivial example is uh, a non-interacting system. Suppose you just have a lot of spins and, each, and a non-interacting spin Hamiltonian, then each spin will just maybe process around its own block sphere. And so you wouldn't expect, you could easily construct some observable where you wouldn't see it thermalize or you wouldn't see it equilibrate. Um, another example is many body localized systems. So these are uh, systems that are strongly interacting, but also uh, have very strong disorder. And because of this strong disorder, you have this emergent set of local conserved quantities. And again, the, these local conserved quantities can, can prevent a system from thermalizing. But then on the other hand, there are some numerical examples that uh, seem to show thermalization for non-integrable systems. Um, and I won't talk really about the examples and maybe just uh, tell you that there's a nice review article here that goes through a few of them. But it's then, a, it's kind of a, a natural question to probe is this connection between thermalization and non-integrability. Non Okay, so um, I'm maybe going to ask you to just uh, keep that in mind for that last point about the connection between thermalization and non-integrability. Just keep that in mind for a few slides. And I'm going to kind of just move on to something slightly different for this intro. And this is an experiment that was done a few years ago uh, here in 2017 um, by groups in, in Harvard, com combined groups between Harvard and MIT. And what they did was they had a, a, a one-dimensional 
system uh, of atoms, a chain of atoms, uh, Rydberg atoms, and they were able to trap them. And they had strong interactions between, between neighboring Rydberg atoms. And this whole, the, each atom itself was, was kind of modeled by a two level system. Um, and the whole, the system as a whole was, uh, it was well approximated by an isolated quantum system. So this is a kind of an interesting test bed for these ideas that I was mentioning earlier about the thermalization of isolated quantum systems. And uh, if you wanted to write down a Hamiltonian for that models the dynamics of this experiment, it would be something like this, uh, the, the mixed field Ising model. So here, uh, MFI, mixed field Ising, there's an Ising interaction here with a strength lambda. And then there's both a, a longitudinal field and a transverse field, uh, capital omega and small omega. And this experiment is, uh, was run in this parameter regime where lambda is equal to omega, much bigger than the, the transverse field value. And um, so if you kind of just substitute in lambda is equal to big omega into, into this first line, you can just rewrite the whole thing. So I've, I've written the kind of similar signs here rather than equals because there's also uh, some constants and uh, multiplied by an identity. So I've just removed that. But this is um, this is kind of the the Hamiltonian that models this um, this experiment, and like I say, they're operating this in the regime where this interaction lambda is much stronger than the um, than the uh, omega. And um, yeah, so actually, you might be thinking like, wh why did I bother writing this first line if this second line is the one that kind of models the experiment? But I'm going to come back to this first line again towards the end of the talk and this mixed field Ising model will reappear. So just that's just why I'm, I'm giving you the first line as well. So uh, this is a very strongly interacting system. It's non-integrable. So this maybe would be, you'd think this might kind of end up giving you the thermalization uh, that I mentioned on the, on the first slide. And so here's um, a couple of plots that show some dynamics for two different initial states with this Hamiltonian. First initial state is just the all down uh, product state. And there you can see, uh, and sorry, just to tell you on the, on the Y axis, I have the, uh, the, lush, the, uh, the echo, uh, the return amplitude for the initial state. So the overlap between the time and well state and the initial state. So obviously it starts off at one in both cases because you start off in the initial state. But for the all down state here, it very quickly decays down to zero and then just stays close to zero with some kind of noisy behavior as you go along. And um, this is kind of easy to understand if, if you really do think of this as a non-integrable system with com complicated dynamics. So you start off in the initial state, but then you know, the state kind of evolves in some complicated trajectory through Hilbert space and you don't really expect this to come back close to its initial state. And here you can see the progression as the system size increases 16 spins, 18 spins, 20 spins. And actually, if you look closely, you can you might be able to see that the, the noise actually tends to get kind of even smaller as you get to bigger system sizes. So this kind of effect of the decaying uh, return amplitude, uh, it kind of goes down and tends to stay towards uh, close to zero. But that's very different from what you get if Instead, you choose a different initial state, this up, down, up, down, up, down product state. There, uh, you see that the initial state tends to revive uh, as time goes on. And this is kind of a, this effect lasts for a relatively long time. You know, there's multiple revivals appearing here. And maybe this, this is kind of what the, that animation that I tried to show you of the ice cream that was uh, uh, melting and then refreezing. This is kind of the, the less dramatic version of what that was supposed to be. This is the return to the initial state, the revivals to the initial state as time goes on. So this is very different from thermalizing behavior. If a system was becoming thermalized, you wouldn't expect it to keep reviving back to the initial state. So there's something a bit unusual going on here, um, despite the fact that this is a non-integrable system. So actually, the, this, these two plots I showed you here this isn't the experimental data from the paper. It, this is actually just the numerics that I did, just because it kind of shows the effects a bit clearer. But this, just for, it, for anyone who's interested, this is the uh, actual experimental data for, um, for nine spins in a chain. So actually, you can see in the paper title, this, they had a 51 atom uh, 
uh, spin chain, uh, but they did kind of a range of experiments for different system sizes. And for this one, they used nine spins. On the Y axis is the position on the chain and the X axis is time. Uh, and the color code here is uh, one corresponds to being in the excited state. Uh, so the, this yellow corresponds to a high probability of being in the excited state and the darker color is low probability of being in the excited state. So this kind of first half, say, of the, this left-hand side of the figure is um, just their state preparation part of their experiment, where they prepare this up, down, up, down, up, down state that I showed you on the previous slide. Uh, they, they prepare this initial state. And then they do a quench and they just let the system evolve by, well, if you want to model it by Hamiltonians, by this Hamiltonian in the parameter regime of very strong interactions. And you can see that the, it decays away, but then you get the revival a revival here where the, actually the um, the initial up down up down state has flipped to more like a down up down up state and then it flips back and then back and this continues on for a few oscillations so when this experiment uh, was published uh, back in 2017 it wasn't very well understood why this was happening you know because it was a non integrable system it was kind of expected maybe that um, yeah. Uh, so, uh, one, one question. Yeah. How does the effect depend on the, on the number of, uh, of atoms? Uh, well, in the experiment? No. Or in, in, in the experiment? Experiments. So, actually, in this paper, this, this kind of part of the story I'm telling wasn't really the main focus of their paper. It was just almost tagged on at the very end as, a, as an extra a bit at the end and as far as I can tell this is the only part that they um, the, the only experiment where they showed what what's relevant to the story I'm trying to tell <laughs> numerically you can see that there's a bit of in this numerical um, simulation you can see that the the amplitudes do go down a little bit as distance size increases and so if you're wondering about what happens in the thermodynamic limit it's not completely clear really and um, if these oscillations go away completely or if there's something left over. Well, the, the reason uh, for my question was that uh, your model Hamiltonian only has uh, a nearest neighbor interaction, whereas in, in the diagram you had, and that what one would expect is um, that you also have significant next to the neighbor interaction. Yeah, yeah, that's true. That's true. That makes a difference. So, yeah, yeah, that could be. Uh, I imagine that those extra, these kind of next to nearest neighbor terms and so on, they probably have uh, an extra effect of maybe uh, suppressing these revivals. Um, but uh, yeah, I'm not completely sure and I'm not even sure if the experiment has been done. So, um, yeah. Yeah. Thanks. Uh, okay, so yeah, the, this, this paper, when it was first published, I think people seemed to be a bit uncertain about what was causing these revivals because it was kind of unexpected. Uh, they expected fast thermalization and they saw long-lived revivals. Um, so then a year later in 2018, there was a paper published that did more of a numerical and theoretical analysis of the, of the model to see if they could understand why these revivals were happening. So it was the same uh, model Hamiltonian. Uh, in the same parameter regime, but actually they could simplify a bit by deriving an, eff oop, by deriving an effective Hamiltonian. Uh, and this is kind of called the PXP Hamiltonian, just because of the, the structure of it, as you can see there's a P, an X and a P here. Um, but this Hamiltonian was derived uh, assuming that these interactions lambda became kind of infinitely strong. And just to give you kind of a sense of, how, of, of uh, why this might be intuitive, here, in this equation, you can see that when lambda, this interaction strength gets very, very big, then you know, there's a very high energy cost to having two neighboring spins both in the up state. And so you know, if, the, if lambda goes to infinity, you can imagine that you're not going to find two spins in this up state because of the energy cost and kind of transitioning into one of these up, up states. And what this effective model does is it just kind of implements that constraint, but on the level of a projector here. So these P's are projectors. You can see the sum of sigma X's is just sandwiched in here between the two projectors. And what the projector does is it just uh, 
can annihilate any state that has two consecutive, two neighboring upstreams. So it's just an effective model to, to describe what's going on here. Um, and in the figure here, I'm just showing that uh, the model is actually non-integrable. So I, I've said it is a couple of times now, but this is kind of uh, some evidence for, for uh, to show that it is. What I've plotted here is the, uh, the level statistics for, for this PXP Hamiltonian. So the level statistics means we just look at two consecutive eigenvalues, so uh, neighboring eigenvalues. Uh, so E alpha plus one minus E alpha, the difference between them is the, is the, uh, the level spacing. And then uh, on the X axis, I just have these level spacings, but normalized. So uh, divided by the mean level spacing. And if you plot the distribution of that, this is a diagnostic for whether you've got uh, an integrable or non-integrable system. And here you can see that, uh, well, uh, I've drawn the lines that you'd expect for an integrable system. It's this orange line, which is the Poisson distribution. And I've drawn the line that you'd expect if it's a non-integrable system, which is this Wigner Dyson uh, distribution. So you can see that the, the level statistics for this PXP model very closely follow this Wigner Dyson distribution. And so this is good evidence that it's a non-integrable quantum system. Um, but then, so the question really is, uh, why are we seeing these revivals happen? And here I've plotted uh, the overlap between these two initial states that we looked at, the overlap of, of the initial states with the energy eigenstates. And you can see for the down, down, down state, this is the state that uh, for the, whose dynamics was kind of consistent with thermalization. It's just kind of a, there's many, many, many eigenstates that all have a very small uh, overlap with that initial state. So nothing really stands out. Uh, this is a log scale. So all of these amplitudes are relatively small. But by comparison, for this up, down, up, down state, the one that had these unusual revivals, there are some states that stand out here and that have a much, much larger amplitude than the others. And these are what they call the many body scars. Um, and actually, they, you can tell that they're roughly, even just visually, you can see that they're roughly equally spaced in energy so that there's some kind of energy free frequency coming out of this that might explain why you actually get the revivals happen. And there's a bit more to it as well, because uh, if you plot, so um, I should have kind of written what this expectation value is with, but uh, this sigma nz is just uh, a, a sigma z on any one of the spin sites. The, the model we're looking at is actually translation invariant, so I don't even have to specify n because you could pick any label and it should give the same value anywhere because it's a translation invariant system. But this is the expectation value with an energy eigenstate E. And um, again, you can see these circle states are exactly the same states that were circled up here for the initial state overlaps. But for the energy, uh, for the eigenstate expectation values here, you can see that this unusual behavior also uh, for this uh, property, uh, for uh, these states also show, so this unusual behavior here where they stand out away from where the bulk of the states are. And then even more, here's, um, this is the half chain entangle entanglement entropy for the energy eigenstates. So take an energy eigenstate, trace out half of the chain and calculate the von Neumann entropy of, of the remaining subsystem. And this is what I've plotted here. And you can see that most of the states have this kind of high, high entropy, but these scar states, uh, again, uh, in all of the, in these three pictures, the circle states are all the same. But here you can see um, that they're low entropy states, uh, even the ones kind of uh, close to the middle of the spectrum. So they, they stand out very much from the bulk of the states. So these are kind of special eigenstates, uh, and these are what they call the quantum many body scars. Okay, so um, this, uh, this slide here is, um, 
the first half of this slide is actually just a repetition of what I gave you earlier on in the first slide. So it's just giving you the, the time evolving expert time evolving observable here, the equilibri equilibrium value and the thermal value. And in the first slide, when I gave that, then I wrote down the question, when does the time evolving value thermalize to the, the microcanonical micro average that you'd expect uh, if, if the system was going to thermalize? And then I suggested that, you know, if the system is integrable, you wouldn't expect it to thermalize. If it's non-integrable, uh, then maybe that's what causes it to thermalize. But then I just gave you an example of a non-integrable system that doesn't thermalize. So what really does, uh, what is the mechanism behind this thermalization? And it seems that the best uh, proposal for why uh, a, an isolated system will thermalize is this eigenstate, thermal, eigenstate thermalization hypothesis. So this uh, eigenstate thermalization hypothesis says that it says that the, an eigenstate expectation value, so these O alpha alpha, these are the, uh, the eigenstate expectation values with the same alpha and alpha here, not alpha and alpha prime. Uh, if they sit on a smooth function of energy in the thermodynamic limit. So just to see that pictorially, these are, these are the eigenstate expectation values except for a specific observable, the sigma Z. And what the eigenstate thermalization hypothesis is saying is that if you go to the thermodynamic limit, uh, these states should all kind of uh, contract into a line here, uh, some kind of smooth line. And this is the mechanism that uh, is purported to be responsible for thermalization. So if a system obeys this eigenstate thermalization hypothesis, then as the system size increases, this kind of spread of states that you see, they should contract onto a line here. And, uh, and then you can actually show that if, if the system obeys that property, then you can just substitute in this value of O alpha alpha into here, into the equilibrium state, and you can actually derive the thermal state from that. But these scars are ETH, so I can say thermalization hypothesis, ETH. These scars are states that violate this uh, ETH. Um, so even though uh, the bulk of these states will contract and kind of uh, all in the thermodynamic limit, they'll sit on a, a smooth line uh, here. Uh, these scar states don't, they stay away from, uh, from, this, from this line. So they're ETH violating. And so this is um, just to give some more context about why these states are, are special and why they, um, why they result in a failure to thermalize for the system. Uh, okay, so that was the background bit about half of the title because the title had the two parts, the quantum sensing and the many body scars. Um, and so now I was going to go, now I'll go on to give the background for the other half, the quantum sensing part. Um, so maybe, uh, maybe Shane, uh, because my questions for, for the yep. part, um, why, uh, why do you get the decay of this, this special behavior? Is that interaction with the environment or is that an intrinsic property? Uh, sorry, Werner, the decay of, of which part did you say? Um, when uh, you, you, recur, you return a number of times uh, to close to the initial state. Yeah. Well, maybe five, ten times or so. Yeah. But then uh, uh, it decays away. So the return gets weaker and weaker. This, uh, this decay here. This, uh, exactly. Yeah. Okay, so, uh, and, uh, well, in, uh, uh, in, in your model system, it's uh, uh, decays more slowly uh, than in the experiment, but uh, you, you get some uh, decay. And uh, so I, I want uh, to understand how that comes about, because if you have a significant uh, CR from absolute squared, uh, for one of the exceptional states, then uh, in principle, if you have no interaction with the environment, uh, that component will stay. 
Yeah. But so, won't the other states won't the other states act as an environment for this, Bernard? I don't know. I don't know. Yeah. So, so th this is the this is the overlap picture of the overlap of the initial state with the energy eigenstates. And there's so th there are these special states that seem to be kind of in a kind of harmonic relationship, like the gap is kind of roughly similar. So that's what's responsible for the uh, persistent oscillations. But there's also these other states uh, which have kind of um, not necessarily kind of, uh, you know, uh, frequencies that match with that frequency. And also uh, the gaps between these circle states are not necessarily exactly the same. There's slight differences between them as well. So um, even if even if there was only overlap with these circle states, uh, there still would be some decay because there's not a perfect harmonic relationship. Yes. So are you able uh, to calculate uh, how many, uh, how often uh, the system will return uh, to the initial state be before it becomes invisible or so? Um. Uh, I, I can't say I've tried. Okay. Yeah, but uh, I can give actually. So this this example of the scarring is interesting, particularly because like there was an experiment that that kind of shows uh, some signatures of it. But later on, I've got maybe a more kind of a cleaner example. There's no experiment, but it's a it's a you, know, you can see kind of more a more perfect uh, effect uh, of continuous oscillation. And in that in that case, yeah, but you said. Uh, that the, the decay uh, basically should depend on the anharmonicity uh, we have in... Uh, yeah, 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 yeah. 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 Okay. So, so in this perfect uh, example that I'll show you later, there's, it's perfectly harmonic and so you just get forever oscillations. Uh, Thank you. Theoretical, ideal case. Uh, Shane, can I ask you something? Yeah. So do you really, so do you need a gap to get always these quantum scars or maybe, I mean, in certain, you know, critical uh, phases, uh, you can still see scars and uh, integral. Um, I, I think again, was, uh, yeah, so I've never, I've never seen any suggestion that the scars are connected to having a gap. Okay, um, so it's not related to the... No, because like it, it's nothing, you know... Uh, if I show you the the initial state overlaps, you know most of the overlaps are here in the middle of the spectrum, and the overlap with the lower part of the spectrum or the upper part of the spectrum are, are very low by comparison, especially since this is a log plot. You know, so this is a very tiny overlap. So I'd imagine that the gap has very little role to play here because it's mainly around the middle of the spectrum that this dynamics is happening. Okay. Okay. I was just thinking how uh, it, it was relevant on, or not to have uh, a tiny gap or large gap or, you know. Uh, all... uh, yeah, as far as I know, it doesn't, it's not relevant. Yeah, okay. but uh, that's just as far as I know. Um, so now just to give some background about the other part of the title, the quantum sensing part. And um, sometimes this goes by the name quantum metrology. So just in case you've seen the two phrases used, they seem to be used kind of interchangeably. And the task, the task for um, a quantum sensing protocol is to estimate some unknown parameter omega through some omega dependent dynamics that the quantum system has. So, for example, uh, you know, just uh, you could be magnetic field sensing, electric field sensing, quantum clocks, gravitational wave detection. And um, so, if it, I'm going to go through the protocol here, but it might help just to keep in mind just the picture. And this this picture here might be helpful. So, here you can imagine these n spins as being uh, your probe system, and there's, they're kind of being uh, influenced by a magnetic field. So, the dynamics of the spins will be affected by this magnetic field. So the sensing protocol is to prepare an initial state first. Um, you know, you'd like it that there will be some optimal state that kind of gives you the best sensing uh, in the end. But this has to be balanced with what's kind of uh, experimentally realistic as well, because you know, if the optimal state is completely infeasible to prepare, then that's not really much good. So you prepare some initial state, 
the state evolves in time just by the usual unitary dynamics, but the Hamiltonian will depend on the parameter that you're trying to estimate. So in this picture here, it'll be magnetic fields. And then uh, after some evolution time, uh, little t, uh, you measure some observable O. And here I've written O an element of M. And what I'm thinking is that M is what you might call experimentally accessible observables. Because just the same as for the initial state, there might be some optimal observable here that gives you the best precision. But really, if the optimal uh, observable is not possible to implement in an experiment, then that's not much good. So you need something realistic here. Um, so after measuring an observable, you know, you get some outcome, maybe the, you know, the, some eigenvalue of this measurement observable, uh, but just one outcome is going to be much good. So you repeat this, uh, this three stage process many, many times. So here I've written this uh, as like capital T over T. So T, little t is the time it takes for one run in this box. And capital T might be the total time resource that you've got available. So you repeat this capital T over T many times. And then once you've accumulated all this data, you, it goes into some final estimate of the parameter that you're trying to, uh, trying to estimate. And um, the, uh, yeah, so, so then if you want to compare different schemes and different aspects of schemes, you know, you need some measure of how good the scheme is. So that's what I've tried to uh, show here on the right-hand side. Um, you know, if, if you, measures this observable many, many times. But for, actually, first, let me say, you know, th this observable will have some dependence on the parameter that you want to estimate, omega. And we kind of assume that this dependence is known. So you know the shape of this blue line, uh, how this expect expectation value varies as a function of omega. And if you know that dependence, once you've, re well, you, you've measured this observable many, many times, you can construct some kind of estimate for the expectation value. And that will help you to kind of use this known functional dependence to kind of get an estimate for what the, the true value of the parameter you're interested in is. And, but because you're measuring this observable, there's going to be some error associated with it. And this is the error here. So there's the, just the quantum uncertainty in the variable itself, uh, the uh, standard deviation of the observable. And then you can divide that by uh, the number of times, the square root of the number of times that you've repeated this experiment as the, you know, just the statistical uh, enhancement of your, of your estimate of the, uh, of the expectation value. And you can see even just visually, it's just a simple matter then to project the error from the y-axis using this kind of known, uh, known dependence to project this error onto an error for the parameter you're trying to estimate. So this is the expression that I'll be using for the rest of the talk for, for the error. Now you can see on the top, it's the, on the numerator, it's just the error in the observable that you were trying to measure. And in the denominator, it's this slope. It's kind of, you can think of that as, as the sensitivity uh, of the observable to the parameter omega that you're trying to measure. And this just gives you the, the error in the parameter. And then we also allow ourselves to minimize this error over some set of uh, observables so that you can choose whichever experimentally accessible observable gives you the best, the, the smallest error. So I'm going to just give a simple, a simple concrete example uh, of this. Um, so this is an example with n uh, spin one particles. And the Hamiltonian is just this simple non-interacting Hamiltonian where it's the sum of the spin SZ operators. And the initial state we prepare in this uh, sensing protocol is just the product state. So uh, it's just a, a simple, each, each spin is in the superposition of the one and the minus one uh, eigenstates of this SZ operator. So I hope you'll, agree that there's nothing too kind of complicated or exotic about this state. It's just a product state uh, with all spins in the same product state. So stage two uh, of the protocol was to just evolve by this Hamiltonian. And because this is just a superposition of eigenstates uh, for each of the non-interacting non particles, uh, when you evolve, you just end up still in a in non-interacting, uh, sorry, still in a product state but just with a phase accumulated, a relative phase between the two 
uh, two parts of the superposition for each spin. Uh, and for this example, I'm going to measure this observable. So this is, again, there's nothing too exotic about this observable. It's just the sum of local operators. So this Sn plus squared operator, th this S plus is the raising operator for the spin one system. So the S plus squared raises you twice. So if you kind of apply this S plus to the minus one state, you go from the minus one to zero. If you apply the S plus to the zero state, you go from the zero to one. So S plus squared applied twice brings you from minus one to one. Uh, and it's just a sum of those operators across all spins. And we have this parameter theta, which we say we can vary and choose the optimal one to give the best, uh, the best sensing precision. Um, so this is very, this is very straightforward. This example is just separable spins, non-interacting Hamiltonian. So all you get is each spin processing around kind of, uh, uh, you know, uh, kind of the, if you want to construct a block sphere, you know, a, a qubit constructed from the one plus one or minus one states, all you get is just the procession around the equator of the block sphere. And you can see this in this, um, picture of the, of the dynamics for this, uh, for some observable O with respect to time, it's just an oscillation. And if you want to use the formula that we derived on the previous uh, equation and the previous uh, slide for the sensing error, then this is a very straightforward calculation. It just takes a couple of lines, but when you do it, you can calculate the sensing error and it's just decreasing in time like this. Delta omega t is one over the square root of the number of particles and then uh, little t times big T. Can I ask a small question? Sure. Uh, you're considering spin half. Uh, sorry, uh, th this was spin ones here. Yeah, but ah, actually, that's what I wanted actually, to say. It's a, it's no, a, otherwise, it's, it is zero, no, it's plus. The square of the racing of Oh, yes, no. yeah, for this observable, it would be zero, yeah. Mm -hmm. um, so actually, you know, uh, I, I've said this is spin one, but really, it's essentially spin half because the, the m is equal to zero state plays absolutely no role so far in this simple example. Okay. Um, but I, I have spin one because it's just going to be helpful later to have introduced the spin one, um, spin one system. Um, okay, so so this the error just gets better, that gets smaller and smaller with more sensing time. And also the error gets smaller and smaller if you increase the size of the system. And so you might think that it would be good to increase the size of the system as much as possible. Uh, just to, to improve, to, to lower the sensing error. But if you, if you look back at this picture and kind of have this picture in your mind again, and you kind of think of wanting to increase the number of spins, then, you know, uh, as you increase the density of the spins, it's going to be hard to stop the spins from interacting uh, often. Uh, so then this Hamiltonian, which is non-interacting, may become an interacting Hamiltonian. So... Now I've just kind of modified the picture a bit to include an interaction term. So this H zero term goes to H zero plus H interacting. And um, here you can see that the evolution stage of the sensing protocol also has the interacting term in there. Otherwise the protocol is exactly the same, the same initial state, the same observable. And if you look at the dynamics of the observable, uh, with this interaction term included, typically what you'll see is something like this. You'll see the decay of the oscillations. Um, because, you know, the, the system won't stay in, uh, in this separable state as it did, in this product state as it did for the non-interacting system. Because of these interactions, there'll be entanglement generated between all the spin one particles. And so, from the perspective of this observable, you get some kind of decoherence effect. Um, and this has an effect on the final sensing error. So uh, if you try to calculate the sensing error, it doesn't just decrease with time indefinitely anymore. You'll hit some uh, optimal value at some, uh, at some optimal sensing time. And that will give you here what I've called omega star, which I call the, the minimum the minimum, the error minimized so that you, so you uh, pick the optimal time. Um, 
so just to say that like this, this is kind of a schematic i haven't actually put in a, a, a some interacting term yet I, I will in a few slides i'll show you kind of an example with a particular choice of an interacting term but this, this is typically what you'd expect uh, with this kind of interacting term So um, we're kind of getting to the, the main point now. So this is um, there's a bit of a trade-off going here. So when you have the interactions, typically you have this form where now the optimal error scales as something like one over square root of n times the, times the uh, optimal sensing time times capital T. So you have this trade-off where you'd like to have you'd like to have as large an n as possible and also a, as long a sensing time as possible. You could try to increase the sense. Yep, so it's a question. Presumably, t star is the quantity that's representing the strength of the interaction. I was looking for it in. Uh... Yeah, yeah. So okay. typically, it might be uh, the the t star might be something like one over uh, the strength of the interaction. So stronger interactions makes this T star shorter and shorter and shorter. Uh, yeah. So from the point of view of the sensing, you might maybe try, try your best to make this system non-interacting by suppressing the interactions as much as possible. That would give you a long T star, but maybe a relatively small N because as I showed you in this, you know, it might mean having a sparse kind of picture here, you know, a low density array of spins. But then on the other hand, if you have the interacting term very, very strong to increase the density and to increase the number of spins as much as possible, then you'll have this short T star. And so there seems to be a bit of a trade off here. So this suggests that you might want to look for ways to avoid this decoherence and thermalization, even in the presence of strong interactions. And so this is where the connection with the scar scarring comes in, because this scarring was showing kind of a uh, long-lived long -lived revivals despite the interactions in the system. Okay, so now I'm just going to give uh, two, these are the main results really, um, the two concrete examples that show uh, that this can work, that quantum, that the many body scars can be exploited for quantum sensing. And so it's sticking exactly with this spin one example that I had going. So. It's exactly the same. It's just all I've done is specified an actual interaction term here. So it's the same, um, it's the same uh, non-interacting Hamiltonian with the SC and the aim is to estimate this omega. And the interaction term now is, uh, so here you can see it's the sum of terms where you know uh, the effect of this S plus S minus term will to be to raise the raise the spin on the nth spin, and at the same time, lower the spin on the n prime spin. It's kind of a flip-flop term. And also, it does it with this phase phi uh, out in front. And this phase actually will turn out to be important. These lambdas, I just take to be uh, you know, any, any real numbers. And, this, uh, non -local. this interaction is non-local. Uh, yeah, so the way I've written, like the way I've written it here, any any n and any n prime could be connected. But actually, you can choose. So it, it actually, I've got an example coming up where I choose this n n prime to be kind of decaying with uh, decaying quadratically with space, or you can have it decay. Actually, as it turns out, uh, you can pick these to be anything really, and and the, it still works. Uh, these lambdas. Um. So. Just to write out uh, in the next line here, this same, this same interaction, but just in a different form. Um, so if you kind of expand out this exponential in terms of cos and sine, you can see that it's the sum of kind of an xx interaction, uh, sxxx plus sy sy, and what's called a, a dialoshinsky maria interaction, DMI, which is the xy minus yx term. Um, so, uh, this, this, with this interaction term, it turns out that the, uh, the Hamiltonian is non-integrable. So here I just show this for an example. Um, these are again, the level statistics. This time for an example, that's just the chain with this kind of interaction term that's decaying with 
distance in the chain. So if you've got an n and an n prime, the, the interaction is decaying with the distance between them. And I assume periodic boundary conditions. And here for phi is equal to pi over two. So this is when the xx interaction vanishes and the DMI interaction is, it's, it's pure, purely the DMI interaction. You can see that it follows the Wigner Dyson, uh, the, the level spacing statistics follow the Wigner Dyson um, uh, shape that you'd expect for a non integrable system. And it's very, very easy to distinguish from the Poisson inter, uh, shape that you'd expect for an, inter, for an integrable system. Um, so rather than kind of do this exact same plot for many, many different values of phi, I've just used a different indicator here, uh, the OR. Uh, so this is just another diagnostic for whether a system is integrable or non-integrable. And I've plotted it as a function of phi. And you can see uh, clearly that the, these circles are the data points. It's always along this uh, dotted uh, dashed black line, which is what you'd again expect for the non-integrable system and far from this dashed red line, which is what you'd expect for the integrable system. So it's an interacting and non-integrable, it's an interacting and non-integrable system. So the, the you might expect, uh, if it weren't for what I told you already about the scars, that this might lead to thermalization and poor quantum sensing. Um, so uh, let me show you now what happens when you go through exactly the same uh, sensing protocol that uh, I described before. So these are the results uh, here in this left hand side. And I've plotted uh, in the color scale, it's the optimal, optimal sensing error. So this d omega star uh, as a function of these, uh, of these interaction parameters. So there's phi and there's lambda. There's lambda, which control, controls the strength uh, for, for this particular example that I told you about with the, the decaying interactions. So uh, the error clearly you can see is the error is small. The, it's close to the yellow over here when the interactions are small. And that's kind of to be expected because when Lambda is small, uh, you're kind of trying to shut off this interaction term. The, the further you go to the left here in this picture, the more you're turning off interactions and getting closer and closer to the non-interacting uh, scenario. So you'd expect the error to be low in that case. But what it also shows is that at, pi, at plus and minus pi over two, you have these areas of low energy that persist even up to very strong uh, interaction terms. And so here in, the, uh, in this row here, I've plotted cross sections of this, uh, of this figure here. So these, uh, these are kind of cross sections going in the horizontal direction. And these are cross sections going in the vertical direction. And uh, these here are the associated uh, optimal sensing times. Uh, and you can see that the error seems to, you know, uh, shrink down to zero at these special points plus and minus pi over two. And uh, the inverse of the sensing time too seems to shrink down to zero at these special points. So another way of saying that is that the optimal sensing time appears to diverge at these special points, plus and minus pi over two. And so uh, the, the numerical data is given by these, uh, these circles uh, in these plots. Um, but the solid lines are actually just plotted by these equations. So these, are, these equations are very good fits to the numerical data, the, 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 um, the circles here. And you can see that the um, the optimal error uh, has this roughly this uh, this form, and the optimal sensing time has this form. So this this shows again, uh, you know, what we can already see in the picture that the optimal sensing time t star, because of this uh, cos of phi uh, in the in the denominator, the optimal sensing time diverges uh, at these special points. So uh, I guess it won't be a big surprise the, that the reason for this is that the system, uh, when you're at this phi is equal to plus or minus pi over two, is many body scarred. And the, it's the many body scars that are responsible for this diverging, um, diverging uh, T star.
And this is the point where the DMI interaction is, uh, where, where you just have purely the DMI interaction and the XX interaction switches off completely. So um, what I've done here is to plot uh, the eigenstate expectation values for this observable N0. N0 is just the sum, it's just the total number of particles in the zero state. And um, you can see that most of the particles have follow this curve, but there are a few very special ones here that uh, have, uh, have a zero expectation value. And these are the scar states uh, for this model. And again, for the uh, half chain entanglement entropy, so if you take each individual eigenstate, take the, take the partial trace to remove half the chain for each individual eigenstate and calculate the von Neumann entropy, most of them really kind of uh, get tightly follow uh, they're very densely packed, especially here in the middle of the spectrum, very densely packed into this uh, high, high entropy area. But these special states are low entropy and very separated from the, from the bulk of the, of the spectrum. So how to explain this? Well, you can actually show uh, in this simple example, or this um, kind of this is a much cleaner example than the previous mixed field Ising model that I showed you before related to the experiment, because you can show here, you can find the form of, the, of, the, uh, of these scar states. They actually turn out to be uh, the Dickey states, symmetric Dickey states. So first, uh, to, to work out what these are, first I just want to um, restrict to a spin half system that's embedded within this spin one system. So, if you kind of, we had in the spin one system, we had the minus one, the zero and the one eigenstates. But if we just restrict to the, the plus and minus one states and forget about the zero state and define a, a raising operator S plus, uh, let's call it sigma plus or minus, uh, which is the uh, spin one raising operator or lowering operator squared. So this takes you between the, the minus one and the plus one states. And we can also define uh, just the sum of these across all spins in the chain, this collective operator, J plus and J minus. So this J plus will kind of serve as a, as a kind of a creation operator that, or, or a raising operator that raises you from the, uh, to, to create a, a collection of states here called, uh, some, these are called the, the Dickey states, the symmetric Dickey states. So starting from the state where all are down, so uh, just the, uh, the product, the separable product state of all, all spin ones in the minus one state, you can raise them uh, one by one. So if you act with this J plus operator, if you act once on this state, you create another state. If you act again, you create another state and you can create N plus one states in total. And these turn out to be exactly these states here. Um, so just to maybe say a word or two, just maybe to convince you. So here, uh, I've told you that you can, if you keep applying this J plus operator, you can create N plus one of these states. Here, these numerics were done for N is equal to eight. And if you count these, you can see that there's nine of these states. So there's an, uh, the number of these states matches exactly the number of states here. Also, uh, these states, don't have any components uh, in the zero, uh, in the uh, in the MN is equal to zero, and uh, none of them have any components in that part of the spin one uh, space, because we've restricted to the 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 kind of embedded spin half system that's just created out of the plus and minus one states. So if you calculate the total number of uh, of uh, this zero state, you'll find that it's zero for these states because they, they have got no component in this zero state. And um, yeah, you, you can prove this. You can prove this. I, I haven't given it, but if anyone wants me to sketch the details uh, after the talk, then I can, I can kind of go through it and, and say uh, how this proof works out. But you can show that for this Hamiltonian, H0 plus H, interact, H interacting, 
these these states are eigenstates of this Hamiltonian with these eigenvalues. So these are the perfectly harmonic uh, gaps uh, that we needed uh, before to, to have this um, this uh, um, these long lived revivals. The key point is that you have to be at this plus or minus pi over two point for phi. It has to be the DMI interaction uh, with the with the XX interaction turned off. And actually, this is true. Uh, this maybe goes back to what Bal asked earlier, but this is true for any lambda n n prime. Uh, it doesn't have to be that you don't have to specify anything about them. They could be any real numbers at all. These lambdas. So in this in these plots, for example, I've picked lambda n n prime uh, to be of this form, where so it's again kind of uh, decaying with distance. But I've chosen these c to be random between 0.5 and one. So there's some randomness in uh, in these uh, lambda parameters for these plots, but again, you see these perfect scars with the perfect harmonic spacing. But Shane, I, I'm not sure why you keep emphasizing the harmonic part of it, because it looks to me like if I found a, a system with any spacing there uh, that were eigenstates, uh, I would have this persistence because they're they're essentially non-interacting with the rest of the system. They're not mixing. If I put it in there, um, their time evolution is going to. Uh, well, so so this example is very kind of idealized because uh, again, because we have this harmonic spacing, and but it's because of this harmonic spacing that in this idealized example, the uh, oscillations will last to infinity. You know, they'll go on forever. And um, if they weren't, if there was some anharmonicity in these uh, spacings, then it it wouldn't. Uh, oscillate like that anymore in this particular example. It wouldn't go on to infinity. So. Sorry, I, I don't know if um, classical uh, comment is allowed. Yep. In this contest. But uh, you you see in uh, CAM theory something similar. Again, non-integrability, it doesn't mean uh, absolute uh, disorder there is order in the disorder I'm, I'm talking from my classical experience yeah so i can't say i'm uh, i know all that much about the cam theory but i do know that people have tried to make connections between uh, 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 in some of the papers that have been written about these quantum scars people have tried to make connections with cam theory um, Yeah, and about how, uh, so, yeah, so f uh, particularly for the earlier model that I talked about, the one relating to the Rydberg uh, atom experiments, um, people have tried to claim that if you kind of, that, that uh, these scar states kind of can be a non-integrable sec or an integrable sector in the Hilbert space, while these states are kind of a chaotic sector. So you have this kind of mixed uh, mixed phase space that seems to be, if I'm not mistaken, uh, what CAM theory sometimes refers to. Um, well, well, there, there is, um, you know, a, a whole discipline of quantum chaos I'm not familiar with. Mm. But uh, just uh, I was provoked by Danjo's comment you don't need in a periodicity like in a two-body system. <laughs> yeah, there, there, can, there can be irregularities that uh, are not uh, rational. Yeah. Okay. So maybe maybe I should have specified that it's it's for the particular application that I'm looking at for the sensing. Um, mm. And for yeah, for for that particular point, so just for for estimating this parameter omega, for there the the um, the har the harmonic uh, gaps are what mm -hmm. kind of give you this uh, this kind of what I showed you here in the previous slides. This kind of uh, you know the fact that this uh, optimal error decreases to zero at these special points. That depends on having these harmonic gaps. Uh, for this particular application, at least. Thank you.
Um, so this is the last bit in this example. I'm going way over time. Uh, so here we have the, um, this is just to show that uh, using these scar states, uh, you can actually rewrite the dynamics. Uh, you can, at this, at this special point where phi is plus or minus pi over two, you can rewrite the time evolved state so that um, it's just a product state at all times. Uh, and this is exactly the state, the time of all state that we had earlier when I showed you uh, the non-interacting system. Sorry, here. The time of all state for the non-interacting system was just the product state. And we can rewrite the dynamics as exactly the same state here um, with these scars. So that explains why you have this diverging uh, sensitivity, uh, diverging optimal sense of time at this point. Uh, okay, so I had a second example here and I'm, I'm just going to race through this because I've, I've gone so much over time already. That, that's okay, we're not rushing, Shane. We, okay, well, we like it, to ask it, questions and enjoy the talk, so it, okay. it should It should be faster anyway than the previous please, example. Please take your time. Okay. Um, so the second example is just to go back to the model that appeared in the experiment earlier. So it's the mixed mixed field Ising model here, and in this parameter regime where lambda is equal to big omega, and both are much much bigger than little omega. So if you remember, this was the kind of experimental setup, and this was the picture we had earlier with the decay of the revival amplitude for the all down initial state and the revivals for the alternating up, down, up, down state. So just using this same model Hamiltonian and constructing a sensing protocol based around this Hamiltonian. So we prepare this uh, initial state, the up, down, up, down, up, down state, evolved by this mean fieldizing model. We measure an observable here. Um, this observable, it's here you can see it, it's got a, it's, um, sorry, just, just to be clear, we're, we're back at spin half particles now for this example. But uh, it's a soup, this observable is a, a linear combination of these odd or even collective spin operators. So this just happens to be the observable that you need to extract this, uh, uh, this uh, information about the, about the parameter um, in this example. And so the error is calculated by minimizing the error over uh, these C parameters, which are these Cs are just real numbers. So any linear combination of this J, J odd, these J odd and J even spin operators. Uh, here the mu is a label, oh, the mu, the mu is X, Y, or Z. So here I plotted the numerical results on the right-hand side. Again, it's this optimized error, delta omega star. And again, when lambda is close to zeros, so around here in the very center of the plot, you see that, so, so these circles, the, both the color and the size of the circle reflects the error. So small circles means small error, and yellow circles means small error. Big red circles means high error. So close to the middle, you can see that the error is low, and that's what you'd expect uh, based on the fact that lambda is close to zero. So it's close to the non-interacting, um, the non-interacting case where you, you're just left with this omega term here. That is, say, wh when lambda and big omega are close to zero, then you're just left with this non-interacting term, and so the error is low. Um, generally, though, if you increase the size of the interaction. You can see the size of the circles increasing, so the error is increasing, uh, and also the color is getting red, so it's getting the precision error, or the error is getting much worse. But there's these uh, special lines uh, where the diagonals, where the error seems to stay low, even as you increase the interaction strength. And these uh, lines are exactly in the area where, uh, so, this was the parameter regime, remember, where the, where the experiment was run, and you got to see this unusual 
revival dynamics. Um, and so lambda equals big omega, much greater than little omega. And so that's exactly these uh, parameter regimes, the diagonals, that this is lambda is equal to omega. Uh, so here below, I've just showed some cross sections uh, again, uh, one cross section along this black line. And you can see that as the interaction strength increases, you're kind of away from this many body scarred, these many body scarred diagonal lines. On this black line, you're away from that. So as you increase the interaction strength, the error just seems to get worse and worse. But if you're on one of these many body scarred lines, you see that it gets worse and worse for a while. But as you tend towards this uh, uh, lambda much greater than omega uh, area where the scars emerge, then you can see actually it starts to dip a bit and you can get the error going down as you increase the interaction strength. And that's maybe kind of unusual, you know, because you might think that uh, based on like the kind of conventional, conventional intuition, you might think that increasing the size of the interactions in your system will always make things worse and worse for the sensing. And that's true for a while, but actually there is a, 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 a regime here where it goes, goes down with increasing interaction strength. And um, my last bit now is just to mention that there was a paper published in 2019 where they found a, a way of perturbing this system to actually enhance the scars. So the, um, the perturbation had this form. And if I do this and add this perturbation to this Hamiltonian and repeat the whole experiment, then actually what you see is that you can make the error go down for a much longer uh, range of parameters. And it kind of follows this uh, one over square root of the interaction strength behavior. So you get that the error decreases as uh, decreases with the size of the, with the increase in the interaction strength. And so again, yeah, it's just this unusual behavior where you have increasing, uh, sorry, decreasing error with increasing interaction strength. And this is because you're in this parameter regime where the many body scars emerge. Why is the golden mean coming yet? Um, that's a that's a bit of a a mystery to me, I think as well. That so in the paper they they did have some they had some analytical argument for how they could construct this perturbation. They had some uh, some methods of uh, trying to enhance the scars and. Uh, I think it was through their analytical arguments where, where these kind of factors uh, started to appear. And beyond that, I don't want to say because I'm not too sure um, why, why it appears. Does eta depend on lambda? Eta? That's a parameter of delta H. Lambda. No, no. Eta. So you, you fix eta and let lambda tend to infinity? Yeah, yeah. No. So nevertheless, uh, already, so a small perturbation already in, enhances the scars. Uh, yeah. Yeah, so this is a, this, this eta uh, for the value that uh, for these, these graphs were done. And this is, is actually in this paper, they found that this was the optimal value. It's like a minus 0 0.1 times of little omega. So it's, it's um, smaller than omega and much smaller than lambda. Um, okay, so I'll just quickly summarize uh, the talk now. So the main idea was that usually you expect that if you have an interacting and non-integrable systems, then that leads to thermalization and poor sensing. And this is kind of the picture to have in mind there. In the non-interacting case, you have uh, uh, just uh, with uh, the error decreasing and decreasing with sensing time. But if there's interactions, you hit a minimum. This is the case usually. But if you have a system with many body scars, then you can get around this. And scars can be exploited uh, to have quantum sensing that is robust um, to certain types of, of, uh, of interaction terms, H int. And I showed this then with the two examples, the spin one, the spin one TMI model and with the spin half uh, mixed field ising model. And this is the one that was related to the Ridbury experiment. 
And just to point you to the reference in case anyone kind of wants to see uh, more details, this is the reference. And there's a few extra bits in the in the paper as well that's not in the talk. And um, so there's a little bit about how the sensing can, you know, in principle, you can further enhance it by instead of uh, preparing the initial state as a separable state, uh, a product state by somehow if you can prepare um, uh, an entangled state, but within the SCAR subspace, then this can further enhance the, the sensing. And also, um, there's a small section on if you have some additional terms, you know, the, the, it's certain strong interactions that the sensing is robust to, but you know, there could be other interactions that the sensing isn't robust to. So there's a small section in the paper about uh, introducing time varying controls that can suppress the unwanted interaction terms, but without affecting the, the, the terms that you're already, you're already robust to because of the scars. Um, okay, so that's the end of the talk. Well, thank you, Shane, for an excellent talk. That was really, really lovely. And it's open to questions. Well, uh, I think thanks for my son, Drew. This was very interesting. Uh, I have two questions. Uh, one is in a bit of line of what Ricardo said, that, um, well, when mathematic, uh, mathematicians look at scarring, uh, and it's a, a big topic, and there are some up the price for that, I think, then uh, they are interested in, in classical counterparts of the system and well uh, being mathematicians say they, they want to have things as simple as possible in, in fact one particle systems in a billion so uh, you know you just have one particle in, in, in two dimensions and uh, with walls uh, uh, like on the billion table uh, mainly at irrational angles, uh, because when, when you have uh, rational angles, uh, then, then you have immobility. And uh, then they see the effects of classical um, uh, closed trajectories. And uh, just I, I wanted to know is there any interaction uh, between uh, what goes on in, in physics and uh, this mathematical discipline? Um, yeah, I think so. So actually, I had <laughs> I had a slide uh, kind of, uh, I think this is what you're talking about, is it? So um, these are the billiard systems and you have uh, somehow this quasi-periodic trajectory on a billiard table. And actually, th this seems to be, so I, I put this slide in because, you know, the the, the terminology scar, like it, it's, it's, it's kind of, um, I know like my, my first exposure to it was through these many body scars, um, but the authors of the paper came up with the name because of, you know, analogies with these single, par single particle scars in these uh, billiard systems. Mm -hmm. um, so here, you know, the, uh, uh, this is just the, the trajectory of a classical particle bouncing around and uh, Below it is the, you know, what a typical eigenstate, uh, the Wigner function for a typical eigenstate uh, looks like at high energies. And um, if you look at the quantum particle in the billiard table, but the the billiard table has these kind of quasi quasi periodic uh, trajectories here, and it seems to have some uh, um, the the some effect of these uh, trajectories on the. Uh, some a, rare, a very small number of rare eigenstates uh, at high energies uh, of the quantum, the corresponding quantum system. Yeah. So in the single particle system, these are the scars. So I think it's it's in analogy with these single particle scars that the terminology many body scars uh, was was introduced. Yes, and um, my my second question may be a bit in particular uh, to your last remark. That uh, probably. Uh, well, some of you in, in their career uh, dealt uh, with uh, systems which basically are not integrable, but have some sector uh, which is integrable, like um, n equal four gauge theories uh, with n equal two uh, sector. Or uh, I saw that in the context of the Rubakov effect, where the well, when you put in the, the sun interaction, then, then everything gets, gets very complicated. And uh, in your initial one, if the Rubakov effect uh, will take place in the usual way, 
But the, the, the topology of the system uh, forces it uh, to proceed in the way interaction or not, even if the interaction is strong. And that's uh, uh, is mirrored uh, by the fact that uh, there is some small subsector which uh, remains uh, integrable. And uh, it, it seems to, uh, that, that's uh, something which seems to occur in, in very many situations. And I, I don't know uh, of uh, maybe a, a unified perspective on it, uh, but certainly it's, it's related uh, uh, to uh, topology. Maybe, maybe Bob has some idea. Mm. Um, I have to say, I don't really know much at all about those models you were talking about. Um, I mentioned that in the papers you read, uh, people talked about uh, some integral sector and the basic of non integral system. Mm. Uh, and uh, this, uh, the extra states, the special states you got, uh, seem to be calculable. In, in any case, uh, much easier to approach by calculation uh, than the generic state. Hmm. So the, the, the Dickens states are what I'm the uh, analogy of the number systems. Yeah. I'm sorry, did, did you say that this was a previous seminar in this series in the, was this Tristan McLaughlin seminar you're referring to? Uh, no, 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 I, I, I was, uh, on my own work in that. It's, ah, okay. It's, yeah, yeah. It's a good one, so I was not going to play with the time. Yeah. It was coming, it was something crazy and interesting. If you have a reference, Werner, for this stuff, would you mind sending it to me if you, if you have one? No problem. Thank you. Other questions? I have a small question. Can Please, you? Bob. Okay. Uh, by the way, the talk was excellent. So Thank I want to, uh, Let me take a, uh, as an example, two torus. Let's be configuration space classically okay? and quantum mechanically. Okay? But uh, I think following Ricardo's remarks, uh, the if I start a trajectory at an irrational angle mm -hmm. on the torus, it will be ergodic on the torus. So the real line acts ergodically on the torus for these things. And uh, so, and presumably uh, this uh, in our, in the language you are using will correspond to total mixing of the two, of the, uh, is close to any part, uh, particular state of the system arbitrarily well. What is the analog of this in your system? For example, uh, all the examples you have given depends on the wave, the initial state that you are starting with. Yeah. Scarring seems to depend on the initial state. Okay? Mm -hmm. So is there a state, is there a way of tuning the state so that it is always ergodic, like in this real line acting on the torus? What is the analog of that in this model? Um. So if we if we look at the so just to just to check that if I'm understanding the correct the question properly, even in the, in this single particle picture, so you know this would be an ergodic tra trajectory here, uh, uh, bouncing around in the stadium. But then you could have like a uh, one of these rare trajectories where you could just bounce back and forward uh, between the walls here, and. Um, so overall, this is an ergodic system, but they've got these rare states that are, and if, if you initialize the system properly, it could just bounce back and forward uh, in this periodic trajectory. And so, you know, analogously in the systems I was talking about, the, 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 the eigenstates that, that are scars, the specialist scar states, they're kind of very rare compared to the other states that just give the normal thermalizing dynamics. So it's only a small number, I would imagine, of these initial states that actually give you this uh, this um, kind of long-lived oscillations. 
but if you kind of pick the state at random from the system, from the uh, from an, an initial state at random from the state space, then I think it, because the, so, so most of the states, most of the eigenstates are not scarce states, I think you'd end up uh, thermalizing. So I don't know if that answers your question. Is that correct? Because I suppose I take any eigenstate of the given Hamiltonian and take that as the initial state, it will never thermalize. So the yeah. Take, so uh, so maybe I'll just go back to the notion sorry, of thermalization. Sorry, sorry, I interrupt. Yep. Chin, I think you answered the question already. There are low entropy states. The scar, the scar states. Yeah. Yeah. So in this picture here, the. the yep. Uh, that's that's the picture. Okay. Okay. But yeah, uh, I have to say, I'm not so familiar with, with all these connections to the, like my, my first exposure to all this is, is from the many body scars. And I know there's a whole world out there of um, classical, uh, classical systems with uh, ergodic, um, yeah, ergodic physics. Well, I'm my, my, so my question that. would be if uh, there is a, well, it's, to you and to the audience, a continuum uh, field theory interpretation. Because that's how I try to translate in my mind. Great talk, by the way. Very good. Um, I, can't well, say yeah, I think I think Bal's question was to do with the energy eigenstates, though. Right. I, I but I, and the difficulty is that you are presenting the states in position space by telling me the spins and an energy eigenstate would be some superposition which would be a very bizarre state presumably uh, from the in position space I, i'm not even sure is, whether is you this, know what they are is this for bal's question yeah i was going back to bal's well, question. so so what what because if this? you put the system in a, in a pure energy state it's just going to stay there yeah yeah yeah, yeah. Uh, there the uh, entropy that uh, was defined by Shane depends on dividing the system into two parts. Okay. Okay. But uh, otherwise, the, you cannot, I don't know how to associate an entropy to a quantum state. Okay. Uh, from what I understood, one does a partial, uh, some, I mean, partial integration over the one of the parts, and it gets an entropy. Okay. Mm. But if that is done for an energy eigenstate and there is nearest neighbor interaction all the way through, it will be some. It will be something finite because the eigenstates will be non-local. Okay, it will mm -hmm. go over the whole system. Okay, but uh, I don't know that that is the criterion. The criterion seems to be that uh, once you stay in the scar states for a very long time. Okay. Yeah. So uh, I'm wondering uh, uh, what there must be an analog of this for the example of the two torus. I don't understand what it is. Okay? I think while well, they are generic states, he, you you pick a random selection of spins up and down in mm -hmm. this, and they will uh, behave like uh, these irrational angles. Yeah. So, so the scar ones, the scar ones are the ones that are behaving like the rational angles, as he explained. He chose ones that were, if he chose an angle which was vertical up and down in his uh, billiard ball example, it's just going to bounce up and down. It's never going to go uh, to leave that. Yes, that's a very special one. That that's the analog of his scar. I Whereas a random a random state in in the spins, it's just going to. You just look and you pick a state here. You, in his uh, diagram, you're rarely going to hit one of those low entropy states. I think that's correct. So if you suppose I take a low initial state psi of zero, which is localized on the lattice, okay? mm -hmm. it will be, a, and there is near, nearest neighbor interaction. Mm -hmm. This will be a superposition of essentially all eigenstates, all energy eigenstates. So it will start oscillating in time between all of them, and it will be ergodic, okay? presumably. Okay? Yep. Uh, so by chance, you may hit up on particular initial state. It's almost precisely the eigen, uh, superposition of finitely many of the energy eigenstates. And that will show this behavior of persistence, I think. Okay? Mm. 
Uh, do you agree? I think that is correct. Yeah. 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 So, so in this numerical example, I think that kind of shows what you're saying, like that this is a, the all down uh, state and yes. it quickly decays away. And that, I guess this is corresponds to more like the ergodic dynamics. And this is a particular example, the up, down, up, down state, where you see this persistent oscillations. Mm. Um, so, yeah, and I, I think what you're saying is, is true, you know, like um, it happens that this all down state is roughly a equal superposition or a kind of very small weight uh, with every or with almost every many, many eigenstates, whereas this up, down, up, down state is hits upon, you know, these scar states in a special way. Okay. I have to go, Shane, but it was an excellent talk. I okay. enjoyed it a lot. Yeah. Oh, okay. Bye. -bye. Uh, bye. Excellent. Uh, any other questions? Well, if can you, I ask something really quickly there? Please go ahead. Yeah. I, uh, so just at a, just at that last comment there, was that saying um was was the idea like that if I just picked like my initial state to be a handful of like a mixture of a few eigenstates? I'd expect some sort of like kind of quasi periodic behavior just because I've only picked a handful of them. Like, but I guess is is this is this how the this like equal energy spacing thing kicks in? Like, like if the if the energy I if the energy space eigenstates I picked weren't commensurate in some sense, I'm not going to yeah. see like a a regular oscillation. Like, yeah. So so um, is, is well, that what you you could always yeah exactly so. You could always pick uh, two, any two eigenstates from the spectrum, anywhere in the spectrum, and if you if you could create the you know an equal weight superposition of these two eigenstates, then mm. you just have like oscillations between them forever. Um, but I think there the the point is that that superposition of just two energy eigenstates is almost certainly going to be a very very complicated state that'll be impossible to prepare in the lab for example and the interesting thing it seems about this many body scars is that you can see it for a state that is actually something reasonable you know and in an experiment uh, you know it's given it's a small relatively small particle number but they have been able to see these oscillations for states that they could uh, prepare in the lab um, so yeah, I think that the problem with that idea of just preparing a very small number of eigenstates and superposition is that generally the eigenstates are so complicated that it's going to be, you know, for most things that you might look at, it's going to be impossible to to prepare such a, an initial state. Yeah, that makes sense. Thanks. Uh, I am reminded, uh, Shane, of a spin echo. Um, but I don't remember the details of it. So <laughs> it is, is, I think it's probably an interacting version, a non interacting version of what you're talking about. Um, spin echo. So um, my, my kind of familiarity with the spin echo is if you just have the, the non interacting system, so just with uh, this, and you have kind of uh, these omegas aren't the same across all, but there's some differences. So the omega has an N subscript and there's some deviations. Uh, and you look at some observable, you will have something that looks like this decay. But if you apply a pi pulse at some points, ha like halfway through the dynamics, the the, fin the spins that are dephasing will tend to re rephase at you know uh, a later time. Um, so this is, I guess, an echo uh, at some point, but yeah, I haven't, I haven't really thought about whether there are connections there. Uh, I do use something similar. So I just mentioned that, uh, like uh, here at the very uh, end, I said that in the paper, I have some time varying controls that can suppress unwanted noise. And that actually is related to a little bit to the spin echo. So some of the unwanted noise might be the, these inhomogeneities in the fields uh, that you're trying to suppress. And there the spin echo can, can um, you know, Get rid of that kind of unwanted dephasing, um, but still without affecting the, the, the scars. Yeah, thanks for reminding me of what I was involved there. Yeah, okay. Um, that was excellent. Any other questions, or will I stop the recording? Okay, I'll stop the recording, and we can.